You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan. Here on the 24th day of June 2017, you're tuned into another edition of the Questions for Corbett podcast series, which, as you might expect from the title, is the podcast where you send in some questions and I supply the answers. As always, many different ways to get your questions in for this podcast. Uh, Perhaps the easiest is just to go to CorbettReport.com, click on the contact button, and you will have a contact form where you can either send me an email or you can record yourself asking a question via the SpeakPipe application that's embedded there on the contact form uh, so you can have the audio uh, question played on this podcast. You can send me video if you want to record a video and put it up on YouTube or Vimeo or any other video sharing service and send me a link to it. I will uh, include that in the next edition of this series. Or you can tweet me uh, using the Q4C hashtag. That's questions for Corbett, the number, the numeral four, Q4C. Or perhaps best of all, if you're a Corbett Report member, you can leave your question for next time in the comment section of this edition of the Questions for Corbett podcast. And speaking of the comment section, Well, as always, there was a lively and interesting discussion going on in the comment section of the previous edition of this series, including some attempts at some answers of the question uh, from at RealPooPooSmith on Twitter, uh, uh, wondering whether there is any such thing as a high-profile terrorist or assassin who wasn't in some way connected with government. And uh, we had a couple of people take a crack at it, including uh, Robert.B., who had offered uh, a list including the Unabomber, Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killers, uh, Squeaky Fromm, and Charles Manson. And I don't know about Bundy. I haven't done a great deal of research into him. As far as I know, he was a genuine psychopath uh, who didn't have any particular government connections, but I'm willing to be corrected on that. And, uh, well, we don't know who the Zodiac Killer was. Ted Cruz, maybe, right? Um... But uh, when you look at Charles Manson and Squeaky Frum and all of that, the whole uh, Laurel Canyon scene, uh, you can turn to researchers like Mae Brussel, pioneering, blazing the trail on that uh, that type of work back in the 70s. Or more recently, Dave McGowan, having uh, pried the lid off of the, the, the Laurel Canyon mind control scene and all of the craziness including uh, government-connected craziness that was going on there. So we'll have to strike Manson off that list. And the Unabomber, oh boy, if you... I I guess there are people out there who don't know about the Unabomber and his background and his connection to, surprise, surprise, MKUltra. Um, But it is... That is a fascinating story when you start to get into it. So that reminds me, thank you very much for reminding me of that, Robert B., that uh, there is a very, very interesting story to be told about the Unabomber and his interesting past, which uh, doesn't often get elaborated on in the mainstream, but is a really interesting story. So I will have to do a podcast on that in the hopefully not too far distant future. Anyway, that was from the previous edition of this Questions for Corbett series. Let's get straight into it this month with uh, straight up opening the mailbag uh, for an email from Ivan who asks the best kind of question, simple, straightforward is newly appointed FBI Director Christopher Ray a member of Skull and Bones? Excellent, straightforward question, and unfortunately not a particularly satisfying answer. The short answer is, I don't know. But there are more details to elaborate. First of all, a slight co- co- correction to the question itself. Uh, R- Christopher Ray, I do not believe, has been appointed yet. He has been nominated by Trump to replace Comey as director of the FBI, but I don't believe he has actually been appointed yet. But uh, barring that, uh, that formality, um, at some point, assuming that he, is, uh, he does become the director... Uh, it is a very good question to be asking, precisely because here are the things that we do know and can point to. Uh, Number one, we know that uh, Christopher Ray was a Yaley. We can get this from the bastion of truthiness itself, Wikipedia. It's right there on his Wikipedia page. He was a Yaley. He graduated summa cum laude, uh, class of 89, 1989, and then went on to uh, get his JD uh, through Yale Law School in 92. So he was class of 89, and uh, that is 
We know that much. We do not have, or at least I do not know of, a confirmed membership list of Skull and Bones Class of 89. Uh, there are compilation lists of Skull and Bones members of unknown and perhaps dubious origin that do not list Christopher Ray, uh, although they do purport to list various other members of the Class of 89. Um, but there is such a list of Skull and Bones members that does include a James McAlpin Ray, W-R-A-Y, same spelling, as a Skull and Bonesman of the class of 36. No, not 1936, 1836. <laughs> so potentially a relation. I don't know. We do know that Skull and Bones tends to run in the family, um, that often, uh, you know, a father, if a father is a member, a son will get tapped, that sort of thing. So... Maybe some relation there, but uh, I don't. I don't even know who James McAlpin Ray is, and that, that isn't at least immediately uh, searchable online. So, um, if anyone has any connections on that, that would be interesting. Uh, there are there. There is at least one confirmed member of uh, eighty nine uh, class of eighty nine that I know of, and that is Paul Giamatti. Oh, that's right, the actor Paul Giamatti, uh, Yaley class of eighty nine confirmed Skull and Bones member. Um, so. If Christopher Ray was a Skull and Bones 89, he would be a brother under the skin with Paul Giamatti. And potentially, I mean, another interesting uh, part of all of this is that, uh, of course, the Yale campus is not just Skull and Bones. There are many other secret societies, including the Manuscript Society, which in 89, another illustrious member of that class of 89 would have been Anderson Cooper, who was part of the Manuscript Society, a different secret society at Yale. Oh, and he also interned for the CIA, but that was only a summer intern thing that he did during his college days. He he gave that up once he went into journalism, right? Hmm. Uh, yes, Anderson Vanderbilt Cooper, a uh, member of Manuscript Society. If you don't know about the Manuscript Society or Wolf's Head or Scroll and Key or any of the other secret societies on Yale, let alone the other secret societies that dot the college landscape around the United States, then you obviously have not yet seen uh, the Truthstream Media Expose of the hundred secret societies that run Amer the uh, run America. A uh, really, really, really wonderful video. It's about a 40, 45 minute video um, that goes through, as it says, a uh, hundred different secret societies and where they came from and who their membership uh, consists of and their weird practices. Uh, just, it really puts it into perspective because people concentrate on something like Skull and Bones. Everyone knows Skull and Bones, but not so many people talk about the Manuscript Society, which Anderson Cooper is an alumnus of, or uh, uh, David Gergen and people like that. Um, there are lots of different secret societies. And when you look at a lot of these Washington critters and high up media people, even actors like Paul Giamatti, you find, hey... Oh, I didn't know you were a bonesman or or whatever secret society. So there you go. Um, so that uh, so whether or not Christopher Ray was a bonesman or perhaps a member of another secret society, class of 89, I don't know. But we all know that Trump would never appoint a Skull and Bones member to his cabinet, right? Yes, it gets even more ludicrous, outrageous, outraging than that. The more you look into Mnuchin and his history, he is everything that the erstwhile Trump supporters and erstwhile swamp drainers would be railing against if it were not for their savior from on high, Donald Trump, having nominated him. Uh, not only was he, of course, a Goldman Sachs banker, as has been noted, but also before that, you might have noticed he was a Yaley. <laughs> Guess what he was tapped into during his time at Yale? That's right, Skull and Bones. Oh, yeah, right. Forgot about that one. But uh, don't worry, Trump supporters. You can always pull out card number 73 from your bag of tricks. Uh, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. That's why he appoints Goldman Sachs alumnus and Skull and Bonesmen to his cabinet, right? Uh, nonsense. Total nonsense. But anyway... I guess the point of the answer is uh, I don't know definitively if Christopher Ray was Skull and Bones and or any other secret society, and perhaps that's the point. Who does know that information? Well, people who are in the society would know it, but uh, the point is that 
the general public doesn't know it unless they want you to know it. And that's the whole point of the, the broader question and uh, its implications. So it's a good question to be asking. And if anybody has any solid information on that, I'm all ears. Please do send it in or uh, put it in the comment section so we can take a look at it. Let's move on to another question. Uh, this one again from the mailbag. This one from Patrick, who writes another very simple and straightforward question. What happened to Libya's gold? Excellent question. Wonderful question. Extremely important question because, precisely because, people who were following the NATO destruction and decimation of that country in the humanitarian love bombing of 2011 will know that at the time it was at least speculated that it was the 144 tons of gold sitting in the Libyan central bank vaults that were uh, at least one motivating factor for that destruction. And lo and behold, then in December 2015, when a bunch of Hillary's emails got released uh, via the State Department uh, FOIA release, who would have guessed it? It turned out that was exactly right. Uh, specifically, there was an email from April 2011 from Sidney Blumenthal to Hill, Hill Dog, uh relating the fact that the Gaddafi's plan for a gold-backed currency was part of the reason for the bombing of that country. Specifically, quoting from that specific email, which I will link in the show notes, of course. Quote, According to sensitive information available to these individuals, Gaddafi's government holds 143 tons of gold and a similar amount in silver. The gold was accumulated prior to the current rebellion and was intended to be used to establish a pan-African currency based on the Libyan golden dinar. This plan was designed to provide the francophone African countries with an alternative to the French franc. French intelligence officers discovered this plan shortly after the current rebellion began, and this was one of the factors that influenced President Nicolas Sarkozy's decision to commit France to the attack on Libya. So there it is in black and white from the horse's mouth. And uh, more details about that email and what it means is found in a uh, global research article. Hillary emails reveal NATO killed Gaddafi to stop Libyan creation of gold-backed currency. So there we go. We know there was 143, 144 tons of gold in the Libyan Central Bank vault at the time of the bombing itself. So what happened to it? Here is a fascinating story that flitted across the radar in May of 2015, uh, sorry, May of 2016, last year, that I did notice at the time, and I don't remember off the top of my head if I wrote an article about it. I certainly was going to, but at any rate, fascinating, weird, amazing story. Uh, we'll take this one from Zero Hedge. Libya's central bank has $184 million in gold in its vault. It just doesn't know the combination. Quote, Imagine a world in which the chief of a central bank didn't have access to ca cash. Now stop imagining and take a look at the situation in Libya, where the central bank chief sits in eastern Libya, while the headquarters is further west in Tripoli. And despite Tripoli sending $23.5 million each month to eastern Libya, it's only a fraction of what central bank governor Ali El-Hibri says is needed to pay the bills. $257 million to be exact. The situation becomes even more strange when the fact that eastern Libya does, actually does have a significant amount of gold and silver that it could use to sell and convert to cash. But it's in a vault that requires a five-number access code that nobody seems to have. Nobody, that is, except for El Hebri's counterparts in Tripoli, and they won't give the code out. End quote. Uh, just a crazy story. It was widely reported in May of 2016, and uh, there were a number of different takes on that story, and uh, there was talk they were going to start issuing two separate currencies, one by the Eastern Libyan Central Bank and one by the government in, the, in Tripoli. And they were, they were basically going to compete with each other, and they weren't going to cooperate. So what happened with this story? Damned if I know. Uh, that story just completely disappeared, for, at least from the Western press, after that sp sp uh, spate of coverage in May 2016. And the latest I can find is regarding continuing squabbles between the central bank governor and the... Uh, the, the Prime Minister of the so-called Government of National Accord in Tripoli, squabbling over whether to sell the gold 
uh, in the vaults to solve a cash crunch in the country. This comes from, uh, I believe, October of last year, um, in which uh, it says, quote, the governor of the central bank of Libya, al-Sadiq al-Kabir, revealed Wednesday that the prime minister of the government of national accord and head of the presidential council, Fayez al sarraj uh, demanded the selling of Libya's gold reserves in order to solve the cash uh, tragic crisis in Libya. We rejected such a demand as it would rid us of strategic reserves. Without them, Libya's last economic defense can collapse, uh, the central bank governor indicated. So that's the latest that I can find, at least with regards to that that question. And they're obviously still con- sort of squabbling over control, who has control of it, who, who can sell it. Uh, we want to sell it to get cash. No, we don't want to sell it because that'll completely tank the currency. Um, But I don't know about that access code specifically, whether that was procured. Um, I mean, there's a lot of question marks around this. And I think part of it is just the complete total blackout and silence on Libya, obviously, since the destruction of that country. Um, Basically, they're yesterday's news. So who cares, right? Um, you, You know, you break it, you buy it is not something that applies on the international stage, at least if you are part of the you know, France, uh, U.S., British, NATO coalition that bombed that country to all to hell. So if any, again, if anyone has any specific information about the access to the, the vault and uh, anything on that, I'd be interested to know. As far as I know, the gold is still there physically in the country, um, but perhaps it isn't. And perhaps somebody with access to that code, you know, snuck it out. Who knows? The stranger things have happened. All right, uh, let's move on to another question, this time an audio question uh, coming in from Susan. I uh, have a question concerning 9-11. So I have seen a lot of documentaries, read a lot of articles, listened to a lot of podcasts, etc. Um, ever since the event uh, took place. And um, I just realized lately that I know very much about, you know, money trails and uh, surrounding legal uh, tricks and and um, governmental structures and people involved and so on. And I know a lot about the physical evidence on the location, what kind of commodities might have been there. Um, and I know a little bit about possibly um, like people who were actually targeted to get killed when it comes to the Pentagon. But what I actually like when it comes to the twin towers, I'm, I'm like also wondering very much who did they kill? Like I, uh, I lack an analysis of this and I question whether um, this is just collateral damage or yeah, you know, is it, maybe more interesting in that. And I would just love to hear your take on that. Thank you for the question, Susan. It's a very broad question. And obviously there were a lot of tenants in the Twin Towers uh, that were affected and lost many, many employees on those days and on that day. So it is, I mean, I'm sure there are many different stories to be told there. I'm not sure, I don't know off the top of my head of a resource that talks about the tenants in the Twin Towers in a general sense and who, you know, who was, who was hit, who was targeted. Um, But, I mean, there are various aspects of that that have been covered in some detail, including in my own work, for example, in 9-11 Trillions, where you will remember that part of that story was Richard Grove's story working for Silverstream Technologies, creating that uh, technological link between uh, Martian McLennan and AIG, an industry first, um, that was taking place uh, in in Marsh's offices in the World Trade Center, and of course Marsh occupying the exact area of the impact zone um, in which tower, the North Tower or the South Tower? I don't recall off the top of my head, but I do remember they were on the 98th floor. Uh, well, that was one of the floors they occupied, which happened to be the floor of an office that uh, was holding a conference call 
that was supposed to include Richard Grove. He was on his way to that meeting when 9-11 began to occur. He was late for the meeting, but there were a number of uh, people in Marsh who he respected and trusted, um, who were looking into the anomalies of that Marsh AIG linkup and the, the software and money that could potentially be pilfered out and uh, the strange purchase orders and $10 million going missing. The The, the people who were interested in trying to get to the bottom of that were all in a conference call on the 98th floor as the planes approached. This fiscal anomalies with respect to the Marsh.com project when I was in a meeting on the 98th floor in October of 2000 with a gentleman named Gary Lasko. Gary was Marsh's North American Chief Information Officer, and that particular afternoon a colleague and I helped him identify about $10 million in suspicious purchase orders after I had recognized that certain vendors were deceiving Marsh and specifically appeared to be selling Marsh large quantities of hardware that were not necessary, as this was later confirmed by Gary. In the spring of 2000, I brought my concerns up to executives inside of Silverstream and I was urged to keep quiet and mind my own business. I went to an executive inside of Marsh and he advised me to do likewise. But then, I mentioned it to a few executives at Marsh who I could trust, like Gary Lasko and Catherine Lee. Ken Rice, Richard Bruhart, and John Oltshoffer, people who became likewise concerned that something untoward was going on. The concerned colleagues I just mentioned were murdered on September 11th, and the executives who expressed dismay at my concerns are alive and free today because of it. I feel it is no coincidence as the Marsh executive who urged me to drop my line of inquiry made sure that his personnel, who I just mentioned, were in the office bright and early for a global conference call before the staff meeting upon which I was to intrude. A conference call which I was informed this executive in question conducted, but attended from the safety of his Upper West Side apartment. Although in getting ahead... The global conference call with Marsh's IT staff on the morning of 9-11, a meeting that included the staff who were investigating the suspicious billing on the Silverstream deal, was confirmed in a 2006 interview with Marsh's then Chief Information Officer, Ellen Clark. Richard Grove had been asked to attend the meeting, but was stuck in traffic on the way to the towers when the attack began. His friends at Marsh were not so lucky. 294 Marsh employees, including all of the participants in the conference call in the North Tower, died that morning. Meanwhile, the Marsh executive who had scheduled the meeting, the same one who had asked Grove to drop the issue of the billing anomalies, was safe in his apartment, attending the meeting via telephone. So all of those people that Richard Grove mentions in that that clip by name are people who presumably were targeted um, for elimination as sort of one extra thing to add into the whole 9-11 operation. I mean, again, there are so many different reasons that it occurred and different targets and different meanings of it but one of them would have been hey well if this if this floor of this building is getting destroyed we might as well get some people in there um so that's one one aspect of one answer to that question i'm sure there are many more possible answers but it's just such a broad question but there is a flip side to that question too because uh, the flip side of that question is well then who should have been in that building that day that wasn't and one answer, as provided again in that clip, is the uh, the person, uh, the unnamed Marsh executive who called that meeting, uh, called that meeting together and brought that conference call together and was conducting it from his Upper West Side uh, apartment, um, not physically there in the office. Uh, amazingly, fortuitously, avoided his own death that day. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Or... How about another story which we talk about in that 9-11 Trillions uh, documentary, specifically the story of the person who was at that time the head of risk management for Marsh and McLennan and went on to become the interim leader of occupied Iraq, Paul Bremer. At the time of 9-11, Marsh's chief of risk management was Paul Bremer, the former managing director of Kissinger and Associates who went on to oversee the U.S. occupation of Iraq. On the morning of 9-11, he was not in his office at Marsh and McLennan, but at NBC's TV studio, where he was delivering the official story of the attack. Uh, It's Paul Bremer, 
want to make sure I'm getting your name right because right. I'm just meeting you right. just at right. this moment. Right. You're, a, you're a terrorism expert. Counterterrorism, I hope. And, and, and can talk to us a little bit about, about uh, who, who could, I mean, there are a limited number yeah. of groups who could be responsible for something of this magnitude. Yes, this correct? is a very well planned, very well coordinated attack, which suggests it's very well organized centrally. And there are only three or four candidates in the world, really, who could have conducted this attack. Bin Laden comes to mind right away, Mr. Bremer. Indeed, he certainly does. Bin Laden was involved in the first attack on the World Trade Center, which had as its intention doing exactly what happened here, which was to collapse both towers. And while we're on this topic of people who conveniently were missing from action at their offices in the World Trade Center that day, of course we have to bring up Lucky Larry. I'm sure by this point everyone involved in 9-11 Truth knows about how Larry Silverstein just happened to not be there at the building where he was working every single weekday uh, because that that day he had a doctor's appointment and he wanted to go to the, the, the Twin Towers, but his wife told him, no, Larry, you have to go to the doctor's. He was, I believe it was a skin doctor. He was getting something looked at that could have been cancerous, so his wife made him go. And if he had have been there, he probably would have died, but... Lucky Larry managed to escape, it, but actually there's more to that story. Um, compiled once again, as always, by Shoestring, uh, doing excellent yeoman's work on all manner of interesting 9-11 uh, uh, stories and, and, uh, and angles. He had an article in 2010, the WTC leaseholder and his associates that cheated death on 9-11. Was it coincidence or foreknowledge? In which he highlights not just the story that, again, I think we all know by now of Larry Silverstein and his doctor's appointment, but also... Uh, Larry Silverstein's son and daughter, who were both late for meetings at the World Trade Center that day. That's right. Two of Larry Silverstein's three children, Roger and Lisa, were vice presidents of Silverstein Properties. And they worked in temporary offices on the 88th floor of the North Tower. And according to the New York Observer, every morning they attended meetings with tenants at the windows on the world at the very top of uh, the towers. So um, presumably, if this had been a normal day and they'd followed their normal routine, they would have both been trapped and died in the buildings. But wouldn't you know it, on the morning of 9-11, both of them were, quote-unquote, running late. And as a result, uh, Roger Silverstein was in the basement of WTC7 when uh, the North Tower was hit, and Lisa Silverstein was subsequently turned away from the complex by police when she arrived late for the meeting. It doesn't end there. In fact, also, Silverstein's top aide, Jeffrey Wharton, was actually at an 8.30 a.m. meeting uh, at Windows at, on the World with the, the meeting that Silverstein missed. Uh, he was meeting Liz Thompson, uh, the executive director of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, to discuss the council's relationship with Silverstein Properties. Um, according to the uh, engineering news, he decided to escort his guest down to the lobby. He cut the meeting short and then escorted his guest down to the lobby. And he got on an elevator at 8.44 a.m., i.e. two minutes before Flight 11 hit. And so they were in the elevator and down uh, uh, and managed to get down before everything went crazy. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, also, and it goes on, also Larry Silverstein's publicist, Howard Rubenstein, who had represented Silverstein for over 30 years and subsequently worked uh, with uh, Silverstein on the reconstruction of the WTC, uh, he also managed to get to a meeting late that morning that managed to save his life. So a suspicious and interesting number of complete coincidences regarding Silverstein-related family members, aides, and, uh, and publicists who all, for one reason or another, either were late or were early and just managed to miss somehow being killed in the towers that day. Lucky Larry is, is not just, uh, it's not just Larry who's lucky, it's everyone associated with him, strangely enough. Anyway, um, so, there, and, and there's even more detail in that so shoestring article. So, that's, I mean, I think that's the other interesting aspect of of that story. And we could spool that out further with the people who just missed their flight that day and and that, those kinds of stories. Um, so there's a lot in there and uh, a lot of different specific angles that could be taken. 
but I hope that serves at least as an entree to the subject. And we will move on to the next question. This time, opening the mailbag, we have a question from Jeremy. I just read a fascinating article about how it is now confirmed that as early as the 1940s, the CIA was secretly promoting modern art as some kind of oblique strategy to counter Soviet culture. To what extent do you think the CIA at all are still up to things like this now? I imagine most of us are aware of the military's connections to Hollywood and the theories about the CIA and rap music, but is there still a connection to high art? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you for the question, Jeremy. And for those who don't know, he's referring to an article that was published in The Independent several years ago about modern art uh, as a CIA weapon. And this is an interesting article, but when it comes to this subject in particular, uh, this is the article that always gets cited, and I've cited it myself. I wrote an International Forecaster editorial in 2013. Five people you won't believe worked with the CIA, and one of them was about this connection, uh, and the person that I focused on was Jackson Pollock, but at any rate, uh, the reading from that article... I wrote, quote, In 1950, Tom Braden set up the International Organizations Division specifically to pay for such diverse artistic endeavors as the touring program of the Boston Symphony Art Orchestra and the animation of George Orwell's Animal Farm, complete with an altered ending that made it more palatable to American audiences. As we now know, thanks to the 1995 admission of former case officer Donald Jameson, they also funded abstract ex expressionist painters from Jackson Pollock to Mark Rothko to Willem de Kooning, end quote. So that's what we're talking about here, an admitted part of the CIA's history to fund some of these uh, abstract expressionist painters as part of the cultural Cold War. Um... And as you mentioned, Jeremy, you talked about the CIA, obviously, connections to Hollywood, which I've obviously talked about before in numerous editions of the Film Literature New World Order podcast, and connections to music. Uh, does anyone remember the story about how U.S. aid tried to infiltrate the Cuban hip-hop scene in order to uh, spark a youth protest movement? I wrote about that in a 2015 editorial, NGOs as Trojan Horses. So yes, we know about those types of connections, but what about the high art connections specifically, painting and sculpture and the like? Is there still a connection there? I don't have any specific info on that, but I can tell you that high art is an interesting commodity in the world of the so-called would-be elite in a few different ways. One, I think, pretty obvious example is the use of high art collection as a form of money laundering. Is a couple of splatters on a canvas worth $10, $10,000, or $10 million? I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder, so we'll give this artist $10 million for this painting. And, you know, who can question that? I mean, it's all legit. So here's this money, and here it goes, and... You know, what connections does that, uh, are involved in that art deal and who gets what cut of what? I think it's pretty obvious to, that that can be used as a, a very highly effective form of money laundering and passing money under the table, well, over the table, but in a, you know, in a covert way to people. Um, but perhaps more intriguingly, I think we all know about the art tastes of various members of the pathocracy, including, of course, the, uh, the Podesta brothers and their set and their interest in Marina Abramovich and spirit cooking and that kind of thing, or Tony Podesta's uh, disgusting pedosexual art collection, um, which is similar to the pedosexual art collection that adorned the walls of Jeffrey Epstein's uh, Miami uh, uh, playhouse, whatever you want to call it, where, uh, which by the way is literally spitting distance from Mar-a-Lago, Trump's Mar-a-Lago, where he recruited at least one of his uh, underage prostitutes. But at any rate, just a horrible story all around. But again, it always connects into this, this art that depicts exactly what it is they're interested in. I mean, it's not, you don't have to go on a limb on that. So there's obviously some very disturbing connections with the art world in those respects. But specifically about the intelligence agencies and their fingerprints on that. I, again, I don't have the specific info on that. So if anyone does have specific pieces of information connecting the CIA or any of the other intelligence agencies to the modern 
high art scene, quote unquote, uh, I'd be very interested to hear about it. But I will leave you, leave you this little tidbit. Did you know that there is an official CIA intelligence art collection? Well, there is, and I will leave the, the link in the show notes so you can check out uh, a little bit of reading on that collection and check out some of the works in that collection. Interesting stuff. All right, let's move on to the next question. This one from a Corbett Report subscriber in the questions for Corbett comments from last episode of this uh, podcast, podcast series. Uh, specifically the question, again, a nice straightforward question. Do you believe that the non-aggression principle in a voluntarist society would logically imply open borders? Uh, the answer is no. It would not logically imply open borders. And no, it would not logically imply closed borders. Because open borders and closed borders are terms that have no meaning in a non-aggression principle adhering voluntaristic society. Uh, those terms are within, embedded within a political social construct that is separate from what a voluntary society is and would be. So the terms themselves, open borders and closed borders, uh, are so part of people's everyday thinking that they take them for granted, but they imply a statist regime. And so if we look and interrogate the words that we are using, open borders, closed borders, those types of words, we can start to see that our entire conception of this question has been molded by the language that we are using to express it. A fine point, perhaps, but one that I did talk about uh, in my recent conversation with Derek Brose about the, uh, the most dangerous philosophy. Uh, and we name this concept what we call decentralized borders. You know, I think that what we're arguing is that the language is messed up, you know, as well, because the property argument and the, and the borders issue, immigration, they're all sort of tied in certain ways. Uh, and then how that ties to the borders that we are saying that the language is all wrong. We're talking about public versus private property when it's all statist. You know, I mean, there's it's really hard to say something's public because people in their minds, they think, oh, people, us, that's ours, you know. But it's really it's owned by the state, you know. And then we have obviously private property with the state it doesn't really exist so much because if they want to use eminent domain, they'll come in there. So we're trying to say that. The language we're using, it's it's part of the problem. It's faulty. You know, a lot of it, we try to address the semantics of the issues, and that's the unfortunate part. There's so many people that like capitalism oh, or communism. You know, there's all these triggering triggering words that people can't even get beyond. We try to cut through that and call for a decentralized border. And again, say that with technology, we're probably the concepts of property and borders and these things that we're going to see in the future are probably beyond anything we can imagine now, especially as. Uh, blockchain technology gets used in new ways beyond just cryptocurrency and, and other technologies that are coming. It's really it's difficult for me to imagine that the concepts of private of property that we have now and these ideas are just going to stay static. That was Derek Bros of theconsciousresistance.com in a conversation that I recorded a couple of months ago with him, talking about his new book, The Manifesto of the Free Humans. And if you haven't read that book yet, please do so. It is freely available online and contains a lot of important ideas about a voluntarist society and what it would look like. And it does specifically address this point. And uh, let me elaborate with some a little quotation from the book itself. Uh, Bros writes, One major roadblock in the borders debate is the use of faulty terminology. A valid objection to the concept of public property is the association of the concept with government-controlled property. However, we do not think public property needs to be exclusively thought of as government property. In his essay, In Defense of Public Space, libertarian thinker Roderick T. Long discusses the problem with the public and private debate. When we think of public property, we think of government property. But this has not traditionally been the case. Throughout history, legal doctrine has recognized, alongside property owned by the organized public, that is, the public as organized into a state and represented by government officials, an additional category of property owned by the unorganized public. This was property that the public at large was deemed to have a right of access to, but without any presumption that government would be involved in the matter at all. I have no interest in defending public property in the sense of property belonging to the organized public, i.e. the state. In fact, I do not think government property is public property at all. It is really the private property of an agency calling itself the government. What I wish to defend is the idea of property rights inherent in the unorganized public. 
it seems as if the time has come to abandon terms like open and closed borders in favor of decentralized borders. We imagine a free society with decentralized borders would consist of a mixture of open borders, closed borders, public property, private property, and unowned land. We believe a network of competing public and private spaces which allow for freedom of movement is most consistent with the sovereignty of the individual. End quote. All right, there's much more elaboration, of course, again, in that Manifesto of the Free Humans, but it goes, I hope, to at least address the point that even the words that we are using in this debate are controlled, are themselves circumscribed within a statist governmental mind work, um, sorry, framework and mindset that governs the, the way that that debate plays out and what it means. If we use these, these terms, open borders and closed borders, that are part of the statist system to try to describe a voluntarist society, they're incompatible. The terms themselves limit the discussion. An important point that I do hope to elaborate further in a more philosophical edition of the podcast coming again, I hope, in the not-too-distant future. So thank you for that question, Richard. And let's move on uh, to another audio question, this time from Schopenhauer. Hello, James. I would like to know what your view is on the school system, especially because you yourself have a degree in the literature, I presume, and also because you have been teaching yourself in Japan. And you could maybe uh, tell us the differences between the school system in Canada and the school system in Japan. Thank you very much. Schopenhauer. Any relation? Anyway, okay. Well, thank you very much for the question. So the summary, uh, the gist of the question, differences between the education system in Japan and Canada and my experience teaching in Japan. It's a good question and one that I have talked about before on the podcast, specifically if you go into the Corbett Report archives and take a look at interview 652, you will find a, my conversation with Brett Vanot of the School Sucks pod, podcast. And if you go to the School Sucks podcast website, uh, it's up there on as episode 209. And it involved, uh, as you might imagine, some degree of talk about my time as an English teacher in Japan and what that taught me about my own public school experience growing up in Canada and the public school system here in Japan. So you talk about this period of discovery for, for yourself around 2005, 2006. You are in Japan at this time. And That's right. And were you, uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to uh, cover here, you were an elementary school teacher in Japan. Were you doing that at that time? I was in the private school teaching um, sector here at that time. So I, I got to Japan in 2004, and until 2007, I was teaching at a private school here. And then in um, 2007, I started teaching in the public elementary school system. And I continued that until 2011 when I started doing this full time. So that, that must have been interesting as these two timelines, uh, first your profession and then all of this research that you're doing as they line up. Uh, how much did you know about the the history or the intentions of, first of all, your own schooling when you started to pursue this as a career? Uh, very little, in at least in terms of concrete data. Um, I don't think that anything that I've learned has been completely surprising to me. It certainly, uh, I've never learned something that really challenged the way I thought that the world was working in a general sense. Because I I, have, I think I've always understood at some level that the education system is is not exactly the ideal that uh, that we are sometimes presented with, but but it is I mean certainly some of the data points and things that I've encountered have been quite interesting, and one of them I think was uh, the century of the self, which which put into perspective uh, I think uh, to a great de- degree what. The way that, uh, for example, the media can be used to manipulate people's perception, and I think it's not a big stretch to go from that to how our e- education works. And so now looking back on my own education in Canada growing up, I can sort of see all of those pieces of indoctrination. And then 
as I was sort of discovering all of this particular data, as I was there in the classroom, I mean, it was interesting to see the ways that uh, that this is actually functioning at a nuts and bolts level here in Japan. And would you say that the origins of Japan's system are similar? In other words, that they worked their way out of Central Europe in the mid 1800s, and that has pretty much become the model for all compulsory school systems in the world? Absolutely so. Uh, in fact, Japan even perhaps more strongly so than in other places, because Japan actually ended up adopting um, the Prussian constitution and, uh, and adopting Prussian education wholesale um, back in the late 19th, early 20th century. So they, the, I think Japan has really been sort of one of the shining models of this education system to a certain degree, at least theoretically, and it, it certainly has its roots in that um, strongly so. Now, how did that affect you? I mean, what what is the pedagogy like for uh, elementary school? Would you would you say it was noticeably different? For example, more strict or regimented than what you experienced in Canada, which I'm guessing is very very similar to the United States. It was certainly more more regimented than I would have uh, expected. Um, of course, there is the the uniforms here, so everyone wears the the uniform, which in and of itself gives it almost a, a type of militaristic feel. If mm. uh, at least at first glance, when you first see it, it it, it is quite uh, quite interesting in that respect. And then um, I, I think one of the first things that I ever encountered when I when I started teaching was the um, when they got all of the the children out into a big um, a big uh, ass assembly out in the in the schoolyard uh, as a way of introducing me to the school and as they're coming in I mean the, uh, each class is coming in you know kind of single file type of thing and they line up on the field and and that type of thing and and, and it was I mean just the overall impression was something almost like a, a military drill kind of thing. And over time, you start to realize that it's it's a little bit more controlled chaos than simply control. But uh, but it is it's still, that's the overwhelming impression that one gets at first. And it's it does look quite a bit different than what you would see in Canada and I'm sure in the U.S. as well. So while well, you're spending the few years that you spent in that system, outside of it, you're learning all this stuff. Uh, you're having this this real philosophical evolution um, how did that affect what you were doing? Did it make it more difficult to go in there every day and to continue to participate in that system? Uh, in some respects, yes. Um, in other respects, I was resigned to the fact that I wasn't going to be able to basically affect much of a, a change or a revolution in, in the teaching um, that I was doing simply because of the the nature of the job and the fact that I was teaching at four different schools. And within that, I was teaching all different grade levels. So basically, I'd see the same class maybe once a month or something. So it wasn't really uh, enough of a window to, to really start implementing anything revolutionary, even if I could. Basically, I mean, I was just teaching these children how to say I like apples or whatever. So it's kind of hard to introduce a revolutionary pedagogy, pedagogy in there. But um, but it was interesting at any rate to be that fly on the wall and to sort of observe what was happening. And there were some things about the system here that I thought were, were if not good, unmitigatedly good, at least at least potentially um, a, a source of, of interesting uh, contrast to what I'd experienced in my own uh, schooling. So... Um, I point people to an, a very, very, very powerful documentary um, called uh, Children Full of Life, which I believe is still available on YouTube for free viewing. And I hope people w will take a look at that. Um, that's an example of, I think, the best that you could possibly expect from the Japanese public uh, schooling system. It basically follows the year in a life of a fourth grade teacher in a Japanese elementary school. And it shows, I think, some of the differences um, that you would find um, to the Western education system, because the Japanese education system is based, as certainly at the elementary school level, to a large extent on the idea of breaking classes into into groups, and every activity and and everything that happens in, throughout the school year is done in those groups, and um, and it's really a system of of the groups kind of policing themselves rather than a center a teacher being the central authority that will tell the the students how to act or behave. I mean, there is that to a certain extent, but I think there's a lot more sort of self policing that goes on, and uh, and that manifests in different ways, including 
uh, there are times here where the teachers will all go for a meeting and they will leave their classes completely to themselves for, for one or two lessons, um, which would basically, uh, from what I remember from my education, never, ever happened in any school that I was at. There would always be a teacher present. So so there was there is sort of more of that that um, horizontal structure in the Japanese system. And that feeds in, I think, quite obviously to the Japanese society itself. When you look at the way that the Japanese society is structured, you see that it is more of a kind of horizontal, we're all in it together, let's, let's, uh, let's work together in this kind of attitude here, which manifests itself on, on a societal daily level um, in an interesting way. And I think that's one of those things that an outsider can see quite clearly that, oh, the education system directly feeds into society. And that starts to make you think about, oh, well, how about my education, my schooling, my upbringing? How mm. did that affect it? And how does that feed into what Canadian or American society looks like today? All right, we'll uh, leave that there. Of course, I do hope that you would check out the rest of that conversation. I think it was an interesting one. But uh, it's, uh, again, it's a very broad question talking about differences between Canadian schooling and Japanese schooling. And to some extent, maybe it's too much of a generalization to to talk about usefully. But I think there are some very broad points that we can make out of it. And I, I, I understand that people will hear about this or that aspect of the Japanese system and come to predetermined conclusions about it. I have a much more mixed feelings about about the Canadian system versus the Japanese system. I think there are positive and negatives to each one and in different ways and for different reasons. But at any rate, it's all part, it's all under the rubric of the Prussian indoctrination system, um, which, as I mentioned in that interview, uh, Japan adopted wholeheartedly when they embraced the Prussian constitution as the model for the Meiji restoration. So anyway, um, there's a lot of history there and a lot of things to explore. Uh, But if you have listened to nothing else that I have said ever in the past, and if you listen to nothing else that I say ever in the future, listen to this one thing that I highlighted in that conversation and that I will take the time and effort to highlight again. That is, you must, must stop what you are doing and watch Children Full of Life, that documentary. That documentary absolutely, it's, uh, mind-blowing isn't even the word. Uh, It really affected me on a very deep level. Uh, Unless you were a psychopath or a sociopath, I'm telling you, you are going to be affected by it too. It is an example of what, what education could be, uh, what it should look more like, or should at least be thought about in that in that manner. It's uh, I won't talk about it too much because you have to see it to understand it. An incredible documentary, and uh, as I say, if you listen to nothing else I ever say, listen to that piece of advice and watch that documentary. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And uh, to, an- to answer any questions before people get into it, uh, that is not a typical classroom in Japan any more than an exceptional, extraordinary teacher in any other country is the regular, you know, that's what all classes look like. Of course it isn't. But that is such a such a powerful example of what could be. And uh, again, you got to see it for yourself. So that's it. We're going to put a bow on this one and uh, tie it up and send it off into the digital ether. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Questions for Corporate podcast. As always, please do get your questions in for next time, and we'll do it all again in a month or so, whenever the uh, particular inspiration strikes. And until then, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again real soon. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Data DVD series. From 2007 to 2016, each set of Data DVDs contains every podcast, every article, every video, and every interview from that year of the website. Celebrate the Corbett Report's decade of alternative media dominance by owning it all, only on these Data DVDs. For more information, please go to corbettreport.com slash data DVD.